This week on the Computer Chronicles, new generation PCs. It's time to rethink what a personal computer should be. Is the old typewriter metaphor a thing of the past? Today we'll look at several innovative approaches to the PC of the future. We'll show you Transphone, part telephone, part PC. We'll look at Apple's new low-cost home computer called Pippin. You'll see the power of the B-Box, a new multiprocessor screamer that uses multiple power PC chips. And we'll show you the Pilot, tiny little thing that extends the reach of your desktop PC. Plus a sneak preview of the new low-cost internet computer from Oracle. All this plus Giles Online, this week's computer news, my pick of the week, all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Acer America, proud supporters of intelligent programming, computer or otherwise. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. With the Internet revolution well underway, computer companies are rethinking what a PC should really be. If there's all that power out there on the net, maybe all we need is a smart terminal. That's the approach of the new Transphone developed in Canada. Tom, we've got a couple of Transphones here to play with. And First of all, give me a kind of guided tour of the box. Transphone is an information transaction appliance, Stuart. And the objective is to give to our customers the kinds of products and services they want. For right, instance, so it looks like a telephone to start with, huh? That's exactly right. In fact, it is a telephone. A handset. That's right. right. It has caller ID, call waiting. If you have email, a little it'll come up on here and mm -hmm. say your email is ready. It has a DSP chip with 10 minutes of messaging. It mm -hmm. has a speakerphone. Okay. As you can see, there's two PC MCIA slots down here. So we could add applications or memory or... That's right. Uh -huh. And also a smart card so that you can do secure transactions uh -huh. on the internet or any other vehicle. Right, let's like. take a look at the back and the ports here. What's all this stuff? There's two telephone lines so that you can talk mm -hmm. and, and go ahead and surf the net. CRT port, printer port, serial port, power source, and switch. All right, now in the back it starts to look like a computer. And in fact, that's it. It looks like a phone, but it's really a PC in a way. And this one is all plugged in and ready to go. So show me how I turn this into a computer. Very simply, we pull it open. There we go, keyboard, full screen, the whole ballgame. Exactly. All right, so I've got all these function keys. So explain what, what I can do with this. This is like a mall. Think of these function keys as being anchor tenants with uh -huh. various different services and so products. So I can go do my banking, for example, if I press F10? Exactly. And you've got a credit card swipe thing. Right. There, huh? And it just read your card, and you just spent some money or got some cash or whatever you needed. Exactly. All right, and over here, postal services. What would I do with that? Right. In fact, we're going to announce that we're going to Canada Post, and this, in fact, provides services for people so that they can actually use the Canada Post Office, check on services, hmm. and a actually do a number of other things with that. Okay, lots of other choices. You've got, what, built-in calculator, calendar functions, all like that. So you've got that stuff in there. Right. Text writer. Uh, There's a virtual mall. You've got a clock in there, a real-time clock. Is that what that That's does? exactly right. Cool. Now, you also had F5 was an internet button, and what's really important is this really gets you onto the web and lets you surf the internet and that stuff, right? And the other machine is right now online and plugged in, so let me move this guy back and show us how this thing works now. And we are hot online. Matter of fact, you're on PCTV's web page right now. That's exactly right. And, and you're using Netscape Navigator, so That's we're right. able to run real, real software here. And can you just... Uh, Sort of cruise around. Can we just sort of surf the net using this yeah, thing? Yeah, we can. What we'll do is we'll go up to the bookmark. And just as if you were cruising the net with any computer, you select where you want to go. For instance, we'll select without Yahoo. And this will take us right into the Yahoo homepage. So it's a phone. It's, it's got all those little MPC MCIA slots and other right. utilities. I can plug in a printer in the back. That's right. And it's a net, net terminal. OK, what it doesn't have, no hard drive. Right. It's only a 286, very little RAM. But the theory is, what's the point? I mean, that's all sitting out there on some server somewhere, right? Exactly. It's remote computing. It's the NC concept, which enables people to use yeah. the power of the remote uh, systems, and you always have up-to-date systems. What's this going to okay. sell for, Tom? This is five hundred dollars for wow. color, three fifty for the black and white. Very impressive. The Transphone. Thanks a lot. At Sun Microsystems, they're working on the PC for the twenty-first century, and it doesn't look much like today's personal computer at all. 
The Sun Project is codenamed Starfire. A visitor to the world of Starfire is not unlike Alice walking through the looking glass. Starfire dwellers are no longer looking at a computer screen. They are inside it, a part of it. A first-time visitor may find it difficult to distinguish between reality and fantasy. And yet, the Starfire project was conceived as a practical, likely successor to today's generation of two-dimensional, fragmented computers. Starfire is essentially the world as a computer. You have a private cyberspace. You can get to it on your portable. You can get to it on the, your desktop computer, or your, in, in the case of Julie in the film, her desk computer. Or you can get to it by bringing your wristwatch close to a public terminal halfway across the world. To demonstrate their concept, Sun Microsystems even produced a short motion picture that mixes live actors with special effects. In an office setting, the seamless desktop and lifelike video conferencing will combine to bring scattered data and distant colleagues together. They call it telepresence. The idea is that you reduce the, the borders between cyberspace and actual space. When we looked at video conferencing, that, we discovered that the problem is not making the remote person feel part of the group. The, par the problem is a sociological problem of the group accepting the remote person as part of the group. When they're on a little TV screen somewhere over in the corner, it doesn't happen. So we brought them up to the table and we made them full size, real life. And in fact, we had a very interesting problem when we got into the editing suite in that they just simply looked like they were sitting at the table. Starfire designers Tug Nazzini and Michael Deering admit that there are some obstacles to overcome. Telepresence will require data transfers of one terabyte per second and display resolutions that are hundreds of times higher than today. But Sun believes that once we get used to the idea of an all-encompassing computing environment, we will never understand how we lived without it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. One of the arguments over the future of home computing is will we add computing power to our television sets or will we add TV capability to our personal computers? Apple is betting that the TV will be the preferred viewing device with a new approach to home computing called Pippin. Mark, we've got a Pippin right over here and when you just look at it, it kind of looks like a video game console. You've got it plugged into a TV set, mm -hmm. you've got a kind of game controller, but it is a lot more than that, isn't it? That's right, Stuart. Uh, the Pippin platform is being positioned by Apple as a new media appliance for access to a vast ar array of interactive content, uh, whether it be on CD-ROM, uh, learning titles, education, self-help, reference, uh, but also an excellent online services and World Wide Web access device. Now, now, how can I do all this stuff with just a little game controller like this? Well, uh, many CD-ROM titles and interactive titles are, in fact, point and click. Yeah, I mean, so you do have a mouse or trackball built in. That's right. I mean, in your living room, you don't have a horizontal service to run yeah. a, a mouse. It's not convenient, so we've, you know, we've built an inverted mouse, if you will, <laughs> okay. uh, but one that's also more uh, palatable for, for game mm -hmm. uh, environments. And you can plug a keyboard in, too, if you needed it, uh, right? Absolutely. The, uh, the structure of the Pippin is such that you can plug uh, any ADB device, in this uh -huh. case uh, Apple keyboards right. or other third parties, into um, the receptacle, and then you have access to tech. All right, let's look at uh, two of the main things it does. I mean, it is a multimedia Mac, if you will, right? So uh, you've got a CD-ROM in there, and I could just play a typical game with my kids or whatever. Uh, that's right. The consumer would, would take... Uh, a CD-ROM for the application that they mm -hmm. wanted to, to, to play or work with and simply put it in the device. All right. And, so that's uh, your little CD-ROM slot in there. Uh, that's correct. It's a 4X CD-ROM drive, very capable technology. Uh -huh. uh, it is a PowerPC based engine. Uh -huh. And here we see a very popular title uh, for the uh, three to five year old bracket of Roterbund's Living Books, Dr. Mm -hmm. Seuss. They say it's PowerPC based. What about the operating system? Is this using the Mac OS? Well, it's, uh, it's a version of the Mac OS. It's really Pippin OS because uh, it's uh, slightly different. Uh, it is, in fact, um, smaller than a, a normal Macintosh OS, and it, it's pressed on every Pippin CD. Uh -huh. The experience is booted from the CD. All right, and a Pippin CD will run on a Mac or run under Windows? Uh, that's right. It will certainly run on a Mac, uh, which means that immediately there are literally millions of playback machines uh -huh. that can play Pippin titles. Uh, and if it's a multi-mode title that's included yeah. a Windows version or DOS version, it would run in that. Okay, now the other thing this does is it lets me use it as an internet terminal, basically, right? So that's would correct. you show me how I'd use this to log on to the net and surf the web and all sure, that stuff? Sure, let's, uh, let's head over here. We'll get out of this title. Okay, come back and play again. It's 
probably important to note, of course, that this is being displayed on a television yeah, set, right. uh, which has, has different technical challenges than an RGB monitor in the computer space. And we've done a lot of work in hardware to try and minimize flicker and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and overscan and things that would Yeah, that's why I'd like to see what, uh, what the web looks like and, and the resolution of a TV set. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it will never be as good as an yeah. RGB monitor. TVs just aren't that good, but we've, we think we've done a good job. But again, with a TV set, I'm probably not going to be eight inches away from it either. I'm going to be that's back That's right, and uh, most people room. aren't going to be surfing the web okay. to read a lot. So we up in real time now using Netscape? Uh, we're booting in. We'll be in real time here with Netscape. Okay. Yeah, let's get to the... Uh, and we can just go surfing around here using Pippin as an internet terminal. Oh, that's huh? correct. I'll just get some bookmarks here. We can go quickly to uh, say the Apple computer page. Mm -hmm. And so it's got sort of modem built in? Uh, the modem uh, either can be built in is a GeoPort compatible device, which okay. means that a GeoPort pod can be um, added to it. In this case, um, our first licensee, which is Bondi Corporation, mm -hmm. Uh, who announced, uh, announced uh, earlier this week that they will begin shipping the device in Japan next week, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, is bundling a modem with, with the device. Okay, what about storage? I think there's no storage in here. Uh, there's some storage. There's 128K of flash memory, uh, so it's non-volatile, but it's, uh, and it's great for... So you can store simple things, bookmarks. Bookmarks yeah. for the Internet and preference files for the game and where you left it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you need more storage than that, there's an optional floppy drive, yeah. uh, and there will be other peripherals available in time with larger storage. Real quick, finally, what's the intended price, Mark? Bondi is uh, shipping this device now at uh, 648,000 yen, which okay. is set uh, by today's rate about $650. Yeah. That's for the device, Great. the modem, and for five titles. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, well, the computer industry is still trying to find the ideal model for a portable computing device. We have laptops, palm tops, and desktops. No one seems to have come up with the perfect combination for the mobile user. One very innovative new approach is the pilot from the Palm Computing Division of U.S. Robotics. And Ed, you've got a pilot right here, and it's so small you have it in your shirt pocket. That's right. It fits in your pocket. All your important personal data you can carry with you anywhere. Uh, on it is an address book, a, a date book, a to-do list, and a memo pad for all your contacts. I can store thousands of records in this small device. So. Okay, now, now position it for me. Why is this different from a uh, Newton or a Sharp Wizard or, or any of these other things? Well, uh, it allows you to carry all your important personal information in your pocket. Like, uh, unlike those products, which are big and bulky, this one actually fits in your shirt pocket. And if you're going to have all your calendar and all your contacts on you, you want to be able to take them with you anywhere. But you have all that same functionality in here? Absolutely. You have a uh, calendar, address book, to-do list, and a memo pad. Um, it's very easy to get access to those and very fast. We actually have one button interface to any of those. It both turns the device on and takes you to prefer, per, the preferred view of mm -hmm. your data. So here's, uh, for instance, today's date. and Or I can go to my uh, address book and click to there on my to-do list or my memo pad. There's also a little calculator on board here. allows you to uh, hunt and peck around and actually uh, do the calculations as well. You know, now the, the thing that I don't like about most of these devices is I have one set of data and information over here in my po portable or palm top device and another set of information in my desktop, which is a nuisance because you're worried that things are going to get out of sync. This is really designed to solve that problem, isn't yeah, this it? This product was designed as a PC accessory as opposed to a standalone product. And it comes with this little cradle here. And this cradle is a, a serial connection to your PC environment. When you come back from being in the field and viewing information and putting information into the device, you drop the device in this cradle, and then it synchronizes with desktop software that comes with the system as well. And we provide you with a full desktop PIM. It's a companion PIM, a personal information manager, that allows you to input information either on the desktop or on the right, handheld. Tell me how you do that. I'm out on the field, I'm on a trip, I make a note, I make a date, I change my calendar, and I come back to the office, and how do I make sure all my databases say the same thing? Well, I'm inputting right now a new entry into my calendar. I'm going to say lunch with Stuart. And that's the graffiti sort of recognition stuff you're using, right? Right. Uh, this allows you to enter text into the system at up to 30 words a minute with 100% mm -hmm. accuracy. I just put in a new date for you. I'm going to drop this device. Okay, so I come back to my office. Right. And I want to make sure my life is in sync here. So what do I, I just stick that in the cradle. Drop it in the cradle, and all I have to do is push this single button right here. That's the entire user interaction with uh, the device and the PC. I push that button, you see it starts to synchronize right now. So I'm now. saying to my PC and to my pilot, sync up, guys. That's right. And uh, this software on the PC, it's called Hot Syncs, going through the synchronization process right now. It's checking the date book. It's doing the address book and to-do list and the memo pad, and it's complete. It just takes seconds so to do So any that. changes I would have made in my little pilot is now being made in my 
in my PIM that's inside my desktop. Right, right you can now. see our appointment just showed up there, lunch with Stuart, um, and that is a new appointment we put in in the field. In addition, you can put information in on the PC, and when you push the button as well, it downloads <laughs> both ways, so it's an so intelligent synchronization. Those two ways, I make all my changes here tomorrow morning before I leave the office, I plug that in and say, update me. That's right, or your secretary or someone else yeah. is back at the office updating all the information. What's it going to cost? Uh, the device, the cradle, all the desktop software comes in a complete package for $299. That's a good differentiator. Thanks a lot. All right, much of the talk about the need for a new low-cost Internet computer has come from Oracle, which is a software company. Recently, Oracle CEO Larry Ellison showed off a prototype of the new Oracle terminal, now officially called the NC, or the Network Computer. The CPU, a monitor, megabytes of memory, and a hard disk filled with software. For more than a decade, these have become the standard parts that make up the desktop computer. But that could change if Oracle, the database giant, finds a receptive audience for its new version of computing called the NC, or network computer. We think that the hardware is too expensive. And the hardware is expensive because, again, it's very general purpose. The software is too complicated, again, very general purpose. So the idea is to create a class of hardware devices that do fewer things, but what they do is they do very well. So they access multimedia, so you can do video and audio. They let you do email. They let you do word processing. They let you access the web. But that's pretty much all they do. Um, it's also our observation that most information is going to be on the network. The NC is actually a group of devices ranging from a thin box that attaches to a television set to a portable version, a multimedia system, and a computer phone combination. For secure access, the units can be activated by personal smart card. They all have one thing in common, however. The software and files are stored and accessed remotely, either on a company network or on the Internet. You know, the key to a network computer is the network. The fact that everything I do is maintained for me back in this safe network site so that I can always get to it from anywhere. And if the device I happen to be using fails for some reason, the information is maintained. I can get to it from another device. Oracle foresees the Internet as the worldwide equivalent of a corporate in-house network, where someone else keeps the hardware humming and backs up your files, and software upgrades arrive automatically. So the idea is to take the rich experience, the graphics, the interactivity, move that to the client, to the, to the device on the desktop, but to have the administration back in the, in the server. So you end up with the best of both worlds. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. With Microsoft and Intel dominating the computing world with their respective control over software and hardware standards, you would think someone would be nuts to introduce a new model for a personal computer with a new operating system. But B Incorporated has done just that with its B-Box, a new approach to high-powered computing. Mark, we've got a B computer over here. Why a new operating system? Why did you feel that was necessary and take on all the risks that are associated with that? Well, B, when it started, we really started with two precepts. One was that one processor per person was not enough. We've been laboring under that assumption for 20 years, and we should get past that into okay. a, to a higher performance computing. The second was that we really needed, again, 20 years of, of computer architecture in the past. We really needed a computer um, architecture that dealt with media at, at its basic level that we could get very high performance if we actually did that, if we actually used what we so know So you wanted today. an OS that was really fine-tuned for multimedia and yes. that was fine-tuned to use multiple processors. Absolutely, basically. and that's deliver workstation-level performance for a very yeah. low price. All right, now in the B-Box we have over here, you have what, two PowerPC chips in it? Two PowerPC 603 processors in the, in the unit we're just... Uh, All right, now, now show me what the advantage of that is. I mean, give us an example of something that's going to take advantage well, of that. Well, this is an example of a, a simple Mandelbrot calculation, floating point graphics type calculation. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see down here is uh, two levels of the processors showing you what's going on in the processors. So if I come up here to the graphics and iterate down on the Mandelbrot set, you'll notice that the pro both processors fire at the same time. That's an example of two processors working on the same problem at the same time to get it done faster. And that and that's what your OS is enabling, really, exactly. getting the most out of those processors. You're not wasting time talking from one to the other. Exactly, so. exactly. Okay, now show me you've got, I mean, this is meant for multimedia, you said, so you can do really cool things in which you can actually run video, run audio at the same time, bring them together. 
Absolutely. All right, how do you and do so that? So this is an example of two uh, dealing with two media streams. One is a MIDI track we have down here. Um, and say another one is a video track we have up here. And say if you wanted to sync these together so that they both ended at the same time and then output it to okay. video. So first papers. task is you're simultaneously playing some digital music and playing some digital video. Exactly. And on top of that, you can perform a third task of syncing them up, basically. Exactly. Huh? And so I'll take the, uh, the MIDI track and we'll drag that to the end of the track. Mm -hmm. And we'll drag the video to the end of the track as well so that they're both synced at exactly the same point. And I'll drag the time icon from one, from the video, down to the MIDI track. Now, if I'll, I move the slider around on the video, you'll notice the slider now they're all synced up. will also be synced up. And if I start them, both of them will end at exactly the same point in time. Okay, multimedia box. Now, you have a sort of grand finale demo here in which you exactly. run 10 million tasks at once on this thing exactly. to show the power of running two power PC chips together. So Set that up for let's me. Let's bring up the uh, Mandelbrot application. I'll bring up the Pulse application. We'll come back to the Universal Mailbox and I'll open up three different videos at the same time. Uh, B logo, cash flow, future phones, let's say. And I'll come back here to the uh, uh, desktop and I'll open up the MIDI folder and open up here and now. And I think, let me open up those videos one more time because okay. I think I missed the click there. Yes, there it comes. We'll play the MIDI track. We have the Mandelbrot set going on. So we're running the Mandelbrot, right. very There's calculation one of, one intensive, of our videos. playing the music, running one video, exactly. running two videos. Video. And let me open up the mailbox again while the third video comes in. There's our third video. And I'll also pl play another audio track on top of the Don't MIDI track Don't try this at well. home on your one processor computer. Exactly. Things will just start slowing down. Real quick, how much is it going to cost and when is it available? It'll be available next quarter and it will cost for a fully configured system. We figure it will street for about $2,500 to $2,700. That's great. Mark, thank you very much. Okay. All right, the next generation of PCs will look different, run different kinds of software, and may even be based on a totally new approach to hardware architecture. Giles Bateman explores a couple of websites that hold some clues for what the 21st century computer will look like. Thanks, Stuart. To get a glimpse of the future of computing, I recommend checking out some of the following websites. Let's start with the Panda Project. These guys are developing technologies and already building some computer systems around them that I think will affect the future of all computer design. Now, we've got two technologies described here, the VSPA semiconductor package and the compass connector. And while the semiconductor package does represent advances in semiconductor design, I think the bigger impact will come from the compass connector. Right now, PCs are all built around a motherboard. Everything connects to the central motherboard. But with the compass connector, PCs will be built more like the internet based on a backbone. This will make them more modular, more scalable, which translates into tremendously more powerful machines that are easily upgradable. No planned obsolescence there. Now that's what's going to happen on the inside of machines. If you want to see what will happen on the outside, let's check out the design firm Design Edge here and take a look at their portfolio. You can see some things they've designed, I think notably the Sensu. Sensu is Japanese for fan. It kind of looks like a fan because this is a handheld computer with a curved screen. Now, while the hardware is going to have some advances, let's hope the software keeps, keeps pace as well. Human Code is a design firm that designs interfaces, and we can take a look at their past portfolio, a lot of multimedia projects. But uh, although these are projects that already exist, if you take a look at some of their interfaces, you can see what your computer screen and interface might look like tomorrow. Thank you, Giles. Now, time for our weekly summary of the latest news in the field of personal computing. Here is this week's Random Access. In the random access file, the computer industry created two more instant multi-millionaires. Recently, Jerry Yang and David Philo, founders of Yahoo, have taken the company public. Yahoo provides a way for computer users to easily search the World Wide Web. The stock opened at $13 and rose as high as $43 during its first day of trading. Met Software has released a program that automatically retrieves and displays worldwide web pages. Called Netriever, users can schedule retrieval so they can start their day with weather, view top news stories at noon, and check stock prices at the close. Retrieved web pages are displayed as wallpaper, screensavers, or slideshows. Have you played SPQR on the internet? The popular cyber site's mystery game will now be brought to CD-ROM by GT Interactive. The company says it plans to work with cyber sites on future CD-ROM titles with internet components. Shopping online is picking up acceptance among internet users. Market researchers say 19% of internet users have actually made purchases online, but 59% are expressing interest in making online purchases. 
Core Dynamics has introduced a video television card for desktop PCs called the Dynamax Hi Res Plus. Users can watch TV and capture images with its video snapshot recorder. The ISA card costs about $300. And New Media has announced a game card for laptop owners. The Game Jammer PCM CIA card features a built-in speaker, so you won't miss any of the noise in your favorite games when you're on the road. That's it for this week's Random Access. We'll send it back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. Not only is the basic model for a computer changing, the model for computer peripherals is also changing, especially pointing devices. It looks now like the portable industry is starting to settle on the TrackPoint device, first used by IBM on the ThinkPad, and now being used by Toshiba, Hewlett Packard, and other notebook manufacturers. What's dumb is that your poor little hands and fingers have to learn one skill for using your desktop pointing device, and another set of muscular skills for using your laptop pointing device. That may be coming to an end, though, with this new desktop mouse substitute from Interlink Electronics. Interlink figures that once you've learned how to use the track point device on your laptop, why not use the same motor skills on your desktop? So they have come up with this desk stick, which lets you do just that. You don't need to clear space on your desk for a mouse pad. You only need one finger to do all your pointing, and you can finally settle on learning only one way to move your cursor around. Now, using the desk stick, and you see it's very easy over here, you can just do all your normal things just with the one finger, this reduces the chance of repetitive strain injuries of the wrist, and since it's all enclosed, you never have to worry about maintenance or dirty parts, and if you're left-handed like I am, it works just as well with either hand. The list price for the desk stick is under $60. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more on the latest in personal computers. I'm Stuart Chaffee. We'll see you here next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Acer America, proud supporters of intelligent programming, computer or otherwise. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Videotape copies of all Computer Chronicle shows are available for $32.50. Please order by show number and topic. And for more detailed information about the series, guests, and products featured, you can also order a subscription to the Chaffee Letter. In each issue, Stuart provides his unique insights and thoughts about the fast-changing world of personal technology. Videotapes and the Chaffee Letter can be ordered by calling 1-800-800-9520 or by writing us at the Computer Chronicles. For more information on anything you've seen on today's program, check out our website at www.pctv.com. <laughs>